Chapter 24 Degrees of Truth and Reality In our last chapter we reached the question of degrees in truth and reality, and we must now endeavor to make clear what is contained in that idea point one and attempt to do this, thoroughly and in detail, would carry us too far. To show how the world, physical and spiritual, realizes by various stages and degrees the one absolute principle would involve a system of metaphysics. And such a system I am not undertaking to construct. I am endeavoring merely to get a sound general view of reality and to defend it against a number of difficulties and objections. But, for this, it is essential to explain and to justify the predicates of higher and lower. While dealing with this point, I shall develop further the position which we have already assigned to thought. The Absolute, considered as such, has of course no degrees, for it is perfect, and there can be no more or less in perfection. Such predicates belong to and have a meaning only in the world of appearance. We may be reminded, indeed, that the same absoluteness seems also possessed by existence in time. For a thing either may have a place there, or may have none, but it cannot inhabit any interval between presence and absence. This view would assume that existence in time is reality, and in practice, and for some purposes, that is admissible. But, besides being false, the assumption tends naturally to pass beyond itself. For, if a thing may not exist less or more, it must certainly more or less occupy existence. It may usurp ground by its direct presence, but again, further, by its influence and relative importance. Thus we should find it difficult, in the end, to say exactly what we understand by having existence. We should even find a paradox in the assertion that everything alike has existence to precisely the same degree. But here, in metaphysics, we have long ago passed beyond this one-sided point of view. On one hand, the series of temporal facts has been perceived to consist in ideal construction. It is ideal, not indeed wholly, but still essentially. And such a series is but appearance. It is not absolute, but relative, and, like all other appearance, it admits the distinction of more and less. On the other hand, we have seen that truth, which again itself is appearance, both unconsciously and deliberately diverges from this rude essay. And, without considering further the exploded claims set up by temporal fact, we may deal generally with the question of degrees in reality and truth. We have already perceived the main nature of the process of thinking. Thought essentially consists in the separation of the what from the that. It may be said to accept this dissolution as its effective principle. Thus it renounces all attempt to make fact, and it confines itself to consent. But by embracing this separation, and by urging this independent development to its extreme, thought indirectly endeavors to restore the broken whole. It seeks to find an arrangement of ideas, self-consistent and complete. And by this predicate it has to qualify and make good the reality. And, as we have seen, its attempt would in the end be suicidal. Truth should mean what it stands for, and should stand for what it means, but these two aspects in the end prove incompatible. There is still a difference, unremoved, between the subject and the predicate, a difference which, while it persists, shows a failure in thought, but which, if removed, would wholly destroy the special essence of thinking. We may put this otherwise by laying down that any categorical judgment must be false. The subject and the predicate, in the end, 
cannot either be the other. If, however, we stop short of this goal, our judgment has failed to reach truth, while, if we attained it, the terms and their relation would have ceased. And hence all our judgments, to be true, must become conditional. The predicate, that is, does not hold unless by the help of something else. And this something else cannot be stated so as to fall inside even a new and conditional predicate. It is, however, better, I am now persuaded, not to say that every judgment is hypothetical. The word, it is clear, may introduce irrelevant ideas. Judgments are conditional in this sense that what they affirm is incomplete. It cannot be attributed to reality as such and before its necessary complement is added. And, in addition, this complement in the end remains unknown. But, while it remains unknown, we obviously cannot tell how, if present, it would act upon and alter our predicate. For to suppose that its presence would make no difference is plainly absurd, while the precise nature of the difference falls outside our knowledge. But, if so, this unknown modification of our predicate may, in various degrees, destroy its special character. The content, in fact, might so be altered, be so redistributed and blended, as utterly to be transformed. And, in brief, the predicate may, taken as such, be more or less completely untrue. Thus we really always have asserted subject to, and at the mercy of, the unknown. And hence our judgment, always but to a varying extent, must in the end be called conditional. But with this we have arrived at the meeting ground of error and truth. There will be no truth which is entirely true, just as there will be no error which is totally false. With all alike, if taken strictly, it will be a question of amount and will be a matter of more or less. Our thoughts certainly, for some purposes, may be taken as wholly false or again as quite accurate, but truth and error, measured by the absolute, must each be subject always to degree. Our judgments, in a word, can never reach as far as perfect truth and must be content merely to enjoy more or less of validity. I do not simply mean by this term that, for working purposes, our judgments are admissible and will pass. I mean that less or more they actually possess the character and type of absolute truth and reality. They can take the place of the real to various extents, because containing in themselves less or more of its nature. They are its representatives, worse or better, in proportion as they present us with truth affected by greater or less derangement. Our judgments hold good, in short, just so far as they agree with, and do not diverge from, the real standard. We may put it otherwise by saying that truths are true, according as it would take less or more to convert them into reality. We have perceived, so far, that truth is relative and always imperfect. We have next to see that, though failing of perfection, all thought is to some degree true. On the one hand it falls short of, and, on the other hand, at the same time, it realizes the standard. But we must begin by inquiring what this standard is. Perfection of truth and of reality has in the end the same character. It consists in positive, self-subsisting individuality, and I have endeavored to show, in chapter 20, what individuality means. Assuming that the reader has recalled the main points of that discussion, I will point out the two ways in which individuality appears. Truth must exhibit the mark of internal harmony, or, again, the mark of expansion and all-inclusiveness. 
and these two characteristics are diverse aspects of a single principle. That which contradicts itself, in the first place, jars, because the whole, imminent within it, drives its parts into collision. And the way to find harmony, as we have seen, is to redistribute these discrepancies in a wider arrangement. But, in the second place, harmony is incompatible with restriction and finitude. For that which is not all-inclusive must by virtue of its essence internally disagree, and, if we reflect, the reason of this becomes plain. That which exists in a whole has external relations. Whatever it fails to include within its own nature must be related to it by the whole and related externally. Now these extrinsic relations, on the one hand, fall outside of itself, but, upon the other hand, cannot do so. For a relation must at both ends affect and pass into the being of its terms. And hence the inner essence of what is finite itself both is, and is not, the relations which limit it. Its nature is hence incurably relative, passing, that is, beyond itself, and importing, again, into its own core a mass of foreign connections. Thus to be defined from without is, in principle, to be distracted within. And, the smaller the element, the more wide is this dissipation of its essence, a dissipation too thorough to be deep, or to support the title of an intestine division point one, but, on the contrary, the expansion of the element should increase harmony, for it should bring these external relations within the inner substance. By growth the element becomes, more and more, a consistent individual, containing in itself its own nature, and it forms, more and more, a whole inclusive of discrepancies and reducing them to system. The two aspects of extension and harmony are thus in principle one, though, as we shall see later, for our practice they in some degree fall apart and we must be content, for the present, to use them independently. Hence to be more or less true, and to be more or less real is to be separated by an interval smaller or greater from all inclusiveness or self-consistency of two given appearances the one more wide or more harmonious is more real it approaches nearer to a single all-containing individuality to remedy its imperfections in other words we should have to make a smaller alteration. The truth and the fact, which, to be converted into the absolute, would require less rearrangement and addition, is more real and truer. And this is what we mean by degrees of reality and truth. To possess more the character of reality, and to contain within oneself a greater amount of the real, are two expressions for the same thing. And the principle on which false appearance can be converted into truth we have already set forth in our chapter on error. The method consists, as we saw, in supplementation and in rearrangement. But I will not repeat here our former discussion. A total error would mean the attribution of a content to reality, which, even when redistributed and dissolved, could still not be assimilated. And no such extreme case seems possible. An error can be total only in this sense that, when it is turned into truth, its particular nature will have vanished and its actual self be destroyed. But this we must allow, again, to happen with the lower kinds of truth. There cannot for metaphysics be, in short, any hard and absolute distinction between truths and falsehoods. With each assertion the question is, how much will be left of that assertion if we suppose it to have been converted into ultimate truth? Out of everything that makes its special nature as the predication of this adjective, how much, if anything, will survive? 
and the amount of survival in each case, as we have already seen, gives the degree of reality and truth. But it may perhaps be objected that there are judgments without any real meaning, and that there are mere thoughts, which do not even pretend to attribute anything to reality. And, with these, it will be urged that there can no longer remain the least degree of truth. They may, hence, be adjectives of the real, but are not judgments about it. The discussion of this objection falls, perhaps, outside the main scope of my work, but one should like briefly to point out that it rests on a mistake. In the first place every judgment, whether positive or negative, and however frivolous its character, makes an assertion about reality. And the content asserted cannot, as we have seen, be altogether an error, though its ultimate truth may quite transform its original meaning. And, in the second place, every kind of thought implies a judgment, in this sense that it ideally qualifies reality. To question, or to doubt, or to suggest, or to entertain a mere idea, is not explicitly to judge. So much is certain and obvious. But, when we inquire further into what these states necessarily imply, our conclusion must be otherwise. If we use judgment for the reference, however unconscious and indefinite, of thought to reality, then without exception to think must be, in some sense, to judge. Thought in its earliest stage immediately modifies a direct sensible presentation, and, although, on one side, the qualification becomes conditional, and although the reality, on the other side, becomes partly nonsensuous, thought's main character is still preserved. The reference to reality may be, in various degrees, undefined and at large. The ideal content may be applied subject to more or less transformation, its struggling and conditional character may escape our notice, or may again be realized with less or more consciousness. But to hold a thought, so to speak, in the air, without a relation of any kind to the real, in any of its aspects or spheres, we should find in the end to be impossible. This statement, I am aware, may seem largely paradoxical. The merely imaginary, I may be told, is not referred to reality. It may, on the contrary, be even with consciousness held apart. But, on further reflection, we should find that our general account will hold good. The imaginary always is regarded as an adjective of the real. But, in referring it, we distinguish, with more or less consciousness, the regions to which it is, and to which it is not, applicable. And we are aware, in different degrees, of the amount of supplementation and rearrangement which our idea would require before it reached truth. These are two aspects of the same principle, and I will deal briefly with each. With regard to the first point, we must recall the one of unity in the world, as it comes within each of us. The universe we certainly feel is one, but that does not prevent it from appearing divided, and in separate spheres and regions. And between these diverse provinces of our life, there may be no visible connection. In art, in morality and religion, in trade or politics, or again in some theoretical pursuit, it is a commonplace that the individual may have a world of his own. Or he may rather have several worlds without rational unity, conjoined merely by coexistence in his one personality. And this separation and disconnectedness we may fail to observe is, in some degree, normal. It would be impossible that any man should have a world, the various provinces of which were quite rationally connected or appeared always in system. But, if so, no one, 
and accepting or rejecting ideas, can always know the precise sense in which he affirms or denies. He means, from time to time, by reality some one region of the real, which habitually he fails to distinguish and define. And the attempted distinction would but lead him to total bewilderment. The real world, perhaps consciously, may be identified with the spatial system which we construct. This is actual fact, and everything else may be set apart as mere thought, or as mere imagination or feeling, all equally unreal. But, if so, against our wills these banished regions, nevertheless, present themselves as the worlds of feeling, imagination, and thought. However little we desire it, these form, in effect, actual constituent factors in our real universe. And the ideas, belonging to these several fields, certainly cannot be entertained without an identification, however vague, of each with its department of the real. We treat the imaginary as existing somehow in some world, or in some by-world, of the imagination. And, in spite of our denial, all such worlds are for us inevitably the appearances of that whole which we feel to be a single reality. And, even when we consider the extreme cases of command and of wish, our conclusion is unshaken. A desire is not a judgment, but still in a sense it implies one. It might, indeed, appear that what is ordered or desired is, by its essence, divorced from all actual reality. But this first impression would be erroneous. All negation, we must remember, is relative. The idea, rejected by reality, is none the less predicable when its subject is altered. And it is predicable again when what comes to the same thing itself is modified. Neglecting this latter refinement, we may point out how our account will hold good in the case of desire. The content wished for certainly in one sense is absent from reality, and the idea, we must be able to say, does not exist. But real existence, on the other hand, has been taken here in a limited meaning. And hence, outside that region of fact which repels the idea, it can, at the same time, be affirmatively referred to reality. It is this reference indeed which, we may say, makes the contradiction of desire intolerable. That which I desire is not consciously assumed to exist, but still vaguely, somehow, and in some strange region, it is felt to be there, and, because it is there, its non-appearance excites painful tension. Pursuing this subject we should find that, in every case in the end, to be thought of is to be entertained as, and so judged to be, real. And this leads us to the second point. We have seen that every idea, however imaginary, is, in a sense, referred to reality. But we saw also that, with regard to the various meanings of the real subject, and the diverse provinces and regions in which it appears, we are all, more or less, unconscious. This same one of consciousness, in varying amounts, is visible also in our way of applying the predicate. Every idea can be made the true adjective of reality, but, on the other hand, as we have seen, every idea must be altered. More or less, they all require a supplementation and rearrangement. But of this necessity, and of the amount of it, we may be totally unaware. We commonly use ideas with no clear notion as to how far they are conditional, and are incapable of being predicated downright of reality. To the suppositions implied in our statements we usually are blind, or the precise extent of them is, at all events, not distinctly realized. 
This is a subject upon which it might be interesting to enlarge, but I have perhaps already said enough to make good our result. However little it may appear so, to think is always, in effect, to judge. And all judgments we have found to be more or less true, and in different degrees to depart from, and to realize, the standard. With this we may return from what has been, perhaps, to some extent a digression. Our single standard, as we saw above, wears various aspects, and I will now proceed briefly to exemplify its detail, if we take, first, an appearance in time, and desire to estimate the amount of its reality we have, on one side, to consider its harmoniousness. We have to ask, that is, how far, before its contents can take their place as an adjective of the real, they would require rearrangement. We have to inquire how far, in other words, these contents are, or are not, self-consistent and systematic. And then, on the other side, we must have regard to the extent of time, or space, or both, which our appearance occupies. Other things being equal, whatever spreads more widely in space, or again lasts longer in time, is therefore more real. But b. Beside events, it is necessary to take account of laws. These are more and less abstract or concrete, and here our standard in its application will once more diverge. The abstract truths, for example, of mathematics on one side, and, on the other side, the more concrete connections of life or mind, will each set up a varying claim. The first are more remote from fact, more empty and incapable of self-existence, and they are therefore less true. But the second, on the other hand, are narrower, and on this account more false, since clearly they pervade, and hold good over, a less extent of reality. Or, from the other side, the law which is more abstract contradicts itself more, because it is determined by exclusion from a wider area. Again the generalization nearer sense, being fuller of irrelevancy, will, looked at from this point of view, be more internally discordant. In brief, whether the system in the true individual is sought in temporal existence, or in the realm standing above events, the standard still is the same and it is applied always under the double form of inclusiveness and harmony. To be deficient in either of these aspects is to fall short of perfection, and, in the end, any deficiency implies failure in both aspects alike. And we shall find that our account still holds good when we pass on to consider higher appearances of the universe. It would be a poor world which consisted merely of phenomenal events and of the laws that somehow reign above them. And in our everyday life we soon transcend this unnatural divorce between principle and fact. We reckon an event to be important in proportion to its effectiveness so far as its being, that is, spreads an influence beyond the area of its private limits. It is obvious that here the two features of self-sufficiency and self-transcendence are already discrepant. We reach a higher stage where some existence embodies, or in any way presents in itself, a law and a principle. However, in the mere example and instance of an universal truth, the fact and the law are still essentially alien to each other, and the defective character of their union is plainly visible. Our standard moves us on towards an individual with laws of its own, and to laws which form the vital substance of a single existence. And an imperfect appearance of this character we were compelled, in our last chapter, to recognize in the individual habits of the soul. Further in the beauty which presents us with a realized type, 
we find another form of the union of fact with principle. And, passing from this to conscious life, we are called on still for further uses and fresh applications of our standard. And the will of the individual, or of the community, so far as adequately carried out and expressing itself in outward fact, we have a new claim to harmonious and self-included reality. And we have to consider in each case the consistency, together with the range and area, of the principle, and the degree up to which it has mastered and passed into existence. And we should find ourselves led on from this, by partial defect, to higher levels of being. We should arrive at the personal relation of the individual to ends theoretical and practical, ends which call for realization, but which from their nature cannot be realized in a finite personality. And, once more here, our standard must be called in when we endeavor, as we must, to form a comparative estimate. For, apart from the success or failure of the individual's will, these ideas of ultimate goodness and reality themselves possess, of course, very different values. And we have to measure the amount of discordancy and limitation, which fixes the place to be assigned, in each case, to these various appearances of the absolute. To some of these provinces of life I shall have to return in later chapters. But there are several points to which, at present, I would draw attention. I would repeat, first, that I am not undertaking to set out completely the different aspects of the world, nor am I trying to arrange these according to their comparative degrees of reality and truth. A serious attempt to perform this would have to be made by any rational system of first principles, but in this work I am dealing solely with some main features of things. However, in the second place, there is a consideration which I would urge on the reader. With any view of the world which confines known reality to existence in time, and which limits truth to the attempt to reproduce somehow the series of events, with any view for which merely a thing exists, or barely does not exist, and for which an idea is false, or else is true, how is it possible to be just to the various orders of appearance? For, if that we are consistent, we shall send the mass of our chief human interests away to some unreal limbo of undistinguished degradation. And, if we are not consistent, yet how can we proceed rationally without an intellectual standard? And I think we are driven to this alternative. We must either be incapable of saying one word on the relative importance of things, we can tell nothing of the comparative meaning and place in the world owned by art, science, religion, social life, or morality. We are wholly ignorant as to the degrees of truth and reality which these possess, and we cannot even say that for the universe any one of them has any significance, makes any degree of difference, or matters at all. Either this, or else our one-sided view must be revolutionized. But, so far as I see, it can be revolutionized only in one of two ways. We may accept a view of truth and reality such as I have been endeavoring to indicate, or we must boldly subordinate everything to the test of feeling. I do not mean that, beside our former inadequate ideal of truth, we should set up, also and alongside, an independent standard of worth. For this expedient, first, would leave no clear sense to degrees of truth or of reality, and, in the second place, practically our two standards would tend everywhere to clash. They would collide hopelessly without appeal to any unity above them. Of some religious belief, for example, or of some aesthetic representation, we might be compelled to exclaim, how wholly false, and yet how superior to truth, and how much more to us than any possible reality. 
and of some successful and wide-embracing theory we might remark that it was absolutely true and utterly despicable, or of some physical facts, perhaps, that they deserved no kind of attention. Such a separation of worth from reality and truth would mutilate our nature and could end only in irrational compromise or oscillation. But this shifting attitude, though common in life, seems here inadmissible, and it was not this that I meant by a subordination to feeling. I pointed to something less possible, but very much more consistent. It would imply the setting up of feeling in some form as an absolute test, not only of value, but also of truth and reality. Here, if we took feeling as our end, and identified it with pleasure, we might assert of some fact, no matter how palpable, this is absolutely nothing, or, because it makes for pain, it is even worse, and is therefore even less than nothing. Or because some truth, however obvious, seemed in our opinion not favorable to the increase of pleasure, we should have to treat it at once as sheer falsehood and error. And by such an attitude, however impracticable, we should have at least tried to introduce some sort of unity and meaning into our world. But if to make mere feeling our one standard is in the end impossible, if we cannot rest in the intolerable confusion of a double test and control, nor can relapse into the narrowness and the inconsistency of our old mutilated view, we must take courage to accept the other revolution. We must reject wholly the idea that known reality consists in a series of events, external or inward, and that truth merely is correspondence with such a form of existence. We must allow to every appearance alike its own degree of reality, if not also of truth, and we must everywhere estimate this degree by the application of our single standard. I am not here attempting even, as I have said, to make this estimate in general, and, in detail, I admit that we might find cases where rational comparison seems hopeless. But our failure in this respect would justify no doubt about our principle. It would be solely through our ignorance and our deficiency that the standard ever could be inapplicable. And, at the cost of repetition, I may be permitted to dwell briefly on this head. Our standard is reality in the form of self-existence, and this, given plurality and relations, means an individual system. Now we have shown that no perfect system can possibly be finite, because any limitation from the outside infects the inner content with dependence on what is alien. And hence the marks of harmony and expansion are two aspects of one principle. With regard to harmony, other things remaining the same, that which has extended over and absorbed a greater area of the external, will internally be less divided. And the more an element is consistent, the more ground, other things being equal, is it likely to cover. And if we forget this truth, in the case of what is either abstracted for thought or is isolated for sense, we can recall it by predicating these fragments, as such, of the universe. We are then forced to perceive both the inconsistency of our predicates and the large extent of outer supplement which we must add, if we wish to make them true. Hence the amount of either wideness or consistency gives the degree of reality and also of truth. Or, regarding the same thing from the other side, you may estimate by what is lacking. You may measure the reality of anything by the relative amount of transformation, which would follow if its defects were made good. The more an appearance, in being corrected, is transmuted and destroyed, the less reality can such an appearance contain, or, to put it otherwise, the less genuinely does it represent the real. And on this principle we succeeded in attaching a clear sense to that nebulous phrase validity. 
and this standard, and principle at least, is applicable to every kind of subject matter. For everything, directly or indirectly, and with a greater or less preservation of its internal unity, has a relative space in reality. For instance, the mere intensity of a pleasure or pain, beside its occupancy of consciousness, has also an outer sphere or halo of effects. And in some low sense these effects make a part of, or at least belong to, its being. And with facts of perception their extent both in time, and also in space, obviously gives us a point of comparison between them. If, again, we take an abstract truth, which, as such, nowhere has existence, we can consider the comparative area of its working influence. And, if we were inclined to feel a doubt as to the reality of such principles, we might correct ourselves thus. Imagine everything which they represent removed from the universe, and then attempt to maintain that this removal makes no real difference. And, as we proceed further, a social system, conscious in its personal members of a will carried out, submits itself naturally to our test. We must notice here the higher development of concrete internal unity. For we find an individuality, subordinating to itself outward fact, though not, as such, properly visible within it. This superiority to mere appearance in the temporal series is carried to a higher degree as we advance into the worlds of religion, speculation, and art. The inward principle may here become far wider and have an intenser unity of its own, but, on the side of temporal existence, it cannot possibly exhibit itself as such. The higher the principle, and he more vitally it, so to speak, possesses the soul of things, so much the wider in proportion must be that sphere of events which in the end it controls. But, just for this reason, such a principle cannot be handled or seen, nor is it in any way given to outward or inward perception. It is only the meaner realities which can ever be so revealed, and which are able to be verified as sensible facts. And it is only a standard such as ours which can assign its proper rank to sense presentation. It is solely by accepting such a test that we are able to avoid two gross and opposite mistakes. There is a view which takes, or attempts to take, sense perception as the one known reality. And there is a view which endeavors, on the other side, to consider appearance in time as something indifferent. It tries to find reality in the world of insensible thought. Both mistakes lead, in the end, to a like false result, and both imply, and are rooted in, the same principle of error. In the end, each would force us to embrace as complete reality a meager and mutilated fraction, which is therefore also, and in consequence, internally discrepant and each is based upon one and the same error about the nature of things. We have seen that the separation of the real into idea and existence is a division admissible only within the world of appearance. In the absolute every such distinction must be merged and disappears. But the disappearance of each aspect, we insisted also, meant the satisfaction of its claims in full. And hence, though how in detail we were unable to point out, either side must come together with its opposite in the whole. Their thought and sense alike find each its complement in the other. The principle that reality can wholly consist in one of these two sides of appearance, we therefore reject as a fundamental error. Let us consider more closely the two delusions which have branched from this stem. The first of these, perceiving that the series of events is essential, concludes from this ground that mere sense, either outward or inward, is the one reality. 
Or, if it stops short of this, it still argues that to be real is to be, as such, perceptible. Because, that is, appearance in the temporal series is found necessary for reality, a premise which is true, an unconscious passage is made, from this truth, to a vicious conclusion. To appear is construed to imply appearance always, so to speak, in person. And nothing is allowed to be real, unless it can be given bodily, and can be revealed, within one piece of the series. But this conclusion is radically erroneous. No perception ever, as we have seen clearly, has a character contained within itself. In order to be fact at all, each presentation must exhibit ideality, or in other words transcendence of self, and that which appears at any one moment is, as such, self-contradictory. And, from the other side, the less a character is able, as such, to appear, the less its necessary manifestation can be narrowed in time or in space, so much the more is it capable of both expansion and inner harmony. But these two features, as we saw, are the marks of reality. And the second of the mistakes is like the first. Appearance, once more, is falsely identified with presentation, as such, to sense, and a wrong conclusion is, once more, drawn from this basis. But the error now proceeds in an opposite direction. Because the highest principles are, obviously and plainly, not perceptible by sense, they are taken to inhabit and to have their being in the world of pure thought. And this other region, with more or less consistency, is held to constitute the sole reality. But here, if excluded wholly from the serial flow of events, this world of thought is limited externally and is internally discordant, while, if, further, we attempt to qualify the universe by our mere ideal abstract, and to attach this content to the reality which appears in perception, the confusion becomes more obvious. Since the sense appearance has been given up as alien to truth, it has been in consequence set free and is entirely insubordinate. And its concrete character now evidently determines and infects from the outside whatever mere thought we are endeavoring to predicate of the real. But the union in all perception of thought with sense, the co-presence everywhere in all appearances of fact with ideality, this is the one foundation of truth. And, when we add to this the saving distinction that to have existence need not mean to exist, and that to be realized in time is not always to be visible by any sense, we have made ourselves secure against the worst of errors. From this we are soon led to our principle of degrees in truth and reality. Our world and our life need then no longer be made up arbitrarily. They need not be compounded of the two hemispheres of fact and fancy. Nor need the absolute reveal itself indiscriminately in a chaos where comparison and value are absent. We can assign a rational meaning to the distinctions of higher and lower. And we have grown convinced that, while not to appear is to be unreal, and while the fuller appearance marks the fuller reality, our principle, with but so much, is only half stated. For comparative ability to exist, individually and as such, within the region of sense, is a sign everywhere, so far as it goes, of degradation in the scale of being. Or, dealing with the question somewhat less abstractly, we may attempt otherwise to indicate the true position of temporal existence. This, as we have seen, is not reality, but it is, on the other hand, in our experience one essential factor. And to suppose that mere thought without facts could either be real or could reach to truth is evidently absurd. The series of events is, 
without doubt, necessary for our knowledge, one since this series supplies the one source of all ideal content. We may say, roughly and with sufficient accuracy, that there is nothing in thought, whether it be matter or relations, except that which is derived from perception. And, in the second place, it is only by starting from the presented basis that we construct our system of phenomena in space and time. We certainly perceive that any such constructed unity was but relative, imperfect, and partial. But, nonetheless, a building up of the sense world from the ground of actual presentation is a condition of all our knowledge. It is not true that everything, even if temporal, has a place in our one-inch real order of space or time. But, indirectly or directly, every known element must be connected with its sequence of events, and, at least in some sense, must show itself even there. The test of truth, after all, we may say, lies in presented fact. We should here try to avoid a serious mistake. Without existence, we have perceived that thought is incomplete, but this does not mean that, without existence, mere thought in itself is complete fully, and that existence to this superadds an alien but necessary completion. For we have found in principle that, if anything were perfect, it would not gain by an addition made from the outside. And, here in particular, thought's first object, in its pursuit of actual fact, is precisely the enlarging and making harmonious of its own ideal content. And the reason for this, as soon as we consider it, is obvious. The dollar, merely thought of or imagined, is comparatively abstract and void of properties. But the dollar, verified in space, has got its place in, and is determined by, an enormous construction of things. And to suppose that the concrete context of these relations in no sense qualifies its inner content, or that this qualification is a matter of indifference to thought, is quite indefensible. A mere thought would mean an ideal content held apart from existence. But, as we have learnt, to hold a thought is always somehow, even against our will, to refer it to the real. Hence our mere idea, now standing in relation with the real, is related also to the phenomenal system of events in time. It is related to them, but without any connection with the internal order and arrangements of their system. But this means that our mere idea is determined by that system entirely from the outside. And it will therefore itself be permeated internally, and so destroyed, by the contingency forced into its content through these chaotic relations. Considered from this side, a thought, if it actually were bare, would stand at a level lower than the so-called chance facts of sense. For in the latter we have, at least, some internal connection with the context, and already a fixed relation of universals, however impure. All reality must be revealed in the world of events, and that is most real which, within such an order or orders, finds least foreign to itself. Hence, if other things remain equal, a definite place in, and connection with, the temporal system gives increase of reality. For thus the relations to other elements, which must in any case determine, determine, at least to some extent, internally. And thus the imaginary, so far, must be poorer than the perceptible fact, or, in other words, it is compulsorily qualified by a wider area of alien and destructive relations. I have emphasized if other things remain equal, for this restriction is important. There is imagination which is higher and more true and most emphatically more real than any single fact of sense. 
and this brings us back to our old distinction. Every truth must appear and must subordinate existence, but this appearance is not the same thing as to be present, properly and as such, within given limits of sense perception. With the general principles of science, we may perhaps see this at once. And again, with regard to the necessary appearances of art or religion, the same conclusion is evident. The eternal experience, in every case, fails to enter into the series of space or of time, or it enters that series improperly, and with a show which in various ways contradicts its essence. To be nearer the central heart of things is to dominate the extremities more widely. But it is not to appear there except incompletely and partially through a sign, an unsubstantial and a fugitive mode of expression. Nothing anywhere, not even the realized and solid moral will, can either be quite real, as it exists in time, or can quite appear in its own essential character. But still the ultimate reality, where all appearances such as merged, is in the end the actual identity of idea and existence. And, throughout our world, whatever is individual is more real and true, for it contains within its own limits a wider region of the absolute, and it possesses more intensely the type of self-sufficiency. Or, to put it otherwise, the interval between such an element and the absolute is smaller. We should require less alteration, less destruction of its own special nature, in order to make this higher element completely real. We may now pass from this general principle to notice various points of interest, and, in the first place, to consider some difficulties handed on to this chapter. The problems of unperceived nature, of dispositions in the soul, and the meaning in general of potential existence require our attention. And I must begin by calling attention to an error. We have seen that an idea is more true in proportion as it approaches reality. And it approaches reality in proportion as it grows internally more complete. And from this we possibly might conclude that thought, if completed as such, would itself be real, or that the ideal conditions, if fully there, would be the same as actual perfection. But such a conclusion would not hold, for we have found that mere thought could never, as such, be completed, and it therefore remains internally inconsistent and defective. And we have perceived, on the other side, that thought, completed, is forced to transcend itself. It has then to become one thing with sense and feeling. And, since these conditions of its perfection are partly alien to itself, we cannot say either that, by itself, it can arrive at completion, or that, when perfected, it, as such, any longer exists. And, with this, we may advance to the consideration of several questions. We found that parts of the physical world might exist, and yet might exist, for us, only in the shape of thought. But we realized also that in the absolute, where the contents of all finite cells are fused, these thought existences must, in some way, be recombined with sense. And the same conclusion held good also with psychical dispositions. These in their proper character, have no being except in the world of thought for they, as we saw, are conditional, and the conditional, as such, has not actual existence. But once more here the ideas, how in detail we cannot say, must find their complement in the whole. With the addition of this other side, they will make part of the concrete reality. Our present chapter, perhaps, may have helped us to see more clearly on these points. For we have found that ideal conditions, to be complete and in this way to become real, must transcend themselves. 
they have to pass beyond the world of mere thought. And we have seen, in the second place, that every idea must possess a certain amount both of truth and reality. The ideal content must appear in the region of existence, and we have found that we have no right ever to regard it as unreal, because it is unable, as such, to show itself and to occupy a place there. We may now apply this principle both to the capacities of the soul and to the unseen part of nature. The former cannot properly exist, and the latter, so far as we saw, certainly need not do so. We may consider them each to be, as such, incapable of appearance. But this admission, we now have learnt, does not weaken, by itself, their claim to be real. And the amount of their reality, when our standard is applied, will depend on their importance, on the influence and bearing which each of them possesses in the universe. Each of them will fall under the head of potential existence, and we may pass on to consider the meaning of this phrase. The words potential and latent and nascent, and we may add virtual and tendency, are employed too often. They are used in order to imply that a certain thing exists, and this, although either we ought to know, or know, that the thing certainly does not exist. It would be hard to overestimate the service rendered by these terms to some writers on philosophy. But that is not our business here. Potential existence means a set of conditions one part of which is present at a certain point of space or time, while the other part remains ideal. It is used generally without any clear perception as to how much is wanted in order to make these conditions complete. And then the whole is spoken of, and is regarded, as existing at the point where actually but a portion of its factors are present. Such an abuse clearly is indefensible. Potential existence is fairly applicable in the following sense. We may mean by it that something somehow appears already in a given point of time, although it does not as yet appear fully or in its own proper character. I will try to show later the positive conditions required for this use, but it is better to begin by pointing out where it is quite inadmissible. We ought not to speak of potential existence where, if the existence were made actual, the fact given now would be quite gone. That part of the conditions which appears at present must produce causally the rest, and, in order for this to happen, foreign matter must be added. But, if so much is added that the individuality of this first appearance is wholly destroyed, or is even overwhelmed and swamped, potential existence is inapplicable. Thus the death of a man may result from the lodgment of a cherry stone, but to speak of every cherry stone as, therefore, the potential death of a man, and to talk of such a death as appearing already in any and every stone, would surely be extravagant. For so large an amount of foreign conditions must contribute to the result that, in the end, the condition and the consequence are joined externally by chance. We may perhaps apprehend this more clearly by a grosser instance of misuse. A piece of bread eaten by a poet may be a condition required for the production of a lyrical poem. But would any one place such a poem's existence already virtually in each piece of food, which may be considered likely by any chance to make its way into a poet? These absurdities may serve to suggest the proper employment of our term. It is applicable wherever the factor present is considered capable of producing the rest, and it must affect this without the entire loss of its own existing character. The individuality, in other words, must throughout the process be continuous, and the end must very largely be due to the beginning. And these are aspects of one principle. For clearly, 
If more than a certain amount of external conditions are brought in, the ideal identity of the beginning and of the end is destroyed. And, if so, obviously the result itself was not there at the first, and could in no rational sense have already appeared there. The ordinary example of the egg, which itself later becomes a fowl, is thus a legitimate application of potential existence. On the other hand, to call every man, without distinction, a potential case of scarlet fever would at least border on inaccuracy. While to assert that he now is already such products as can be produced only by his own disintegration would be obviously absurd. Potential existence can, in brief, be used only where development or evolution retains its proper meaning. And by the meaning of evolution I do not understand that arbitrary misuse of the term, which has been advocated by a so-called system of philosophy. Under certain conditions, then, the idea of potential being may be employed. But I must add at once that it can be employed nowhere with complete truth and accuracy. For, in order for anything to evolve itself, outer conditions must come in, and it is impossible in the end to assign a limit to the extent of this foreign matter. The genuine cause always must be the whole cause, and the whole cause never could be complete until it had taken in the universe. This is no mere speculative refinement, but a difficulty experienced in working, and we met it lately while inquiring into the body and soul. In strictness you can never assert that a thing will be, because of that which it is. But, where you cannot assert this, potential existence is partly inaccurate. It must be applied more or less vaguely, and more or less on sufferance. We are, in brief, placed between two dangers. If, with anything finite, you refuse wholly to predicate its relations, relations necessarily in part external, and in part, therefore, variable, then your account of this thing will fall short and be empty. But, otherwise, you will be affirming of the thing that which only it may be. And, once driven to enter on this course, you are hurried away beyond all landmarks. You are forced indefinitely to go on expanding the subject of your predicates until at last it has disappeared into something quite different. And hence, in employing potential existence, we are, so to speak, on an inclined plane. We start by saying, A is such that, under probable conditions, its nature will develop into B, and therefore, because of this, I venture already to call it pound. And we end by claiming that, because it may possibly be made to pass into another result C, C may, therefore, on this account, be predicated already. And we have to hold to this, although C, to but a very small extent, has been produced by A, and although, in the result, A itself may have totally vanished. We must therefore admit that potential existence implies, to some extent, a compromise. Its use, in fact, cannot be defined upon a very strict principle. Still, by bearing in mind what the term endeavors to mean, and what it always must be taken more or less to involve, we may, in practice, succeed in employing it conveniently and safely. But it will remain, in the end, a widespread source of confusion and danger. The more a writer feels himself led naturally to have recourse to this phrase, the better cause he probably has for at least attempting to avoid it it may throw light on several problems, if we consider further the general nature of possibility and chance. We touched on this subject above, when we inquired if complete possibility is the same as reality. Our answer to that question may be summed up thus, 
possibility implies the separation of thought from existence. But, on the other hand, since these two extremes are essentially one, each, while divided from the other, is internally defective. Hence, if the possible could be completed as such, it would have passed into the real. But, in reaching this goal, it would have ceased altogether to be mere thought, and it would in consequence, therefore, be no longer possibility. The possible implies always the partial division of idea from reality. It is, properly, the consequence in thought from an ideal antecedent. It follows from a set of conditions, a system which is never complete in itself, and which is not taken to be real, as such, except through part of its area. But this last qualification is necessary. The possible, itself, is not real, but its essence partly transcends ideas, and it has no meaning at all unless it is possible really. It must be developed from, and be relative to, a real basis. And, hence, there can be no such thing as unconditional possibility. The possible, in other words, is always relative. And, if it attempts to be free, it ceases to be itself. We shall understand this, perhaps, better, if we recall the nature of relative chance. Chance is the given fact which falls outside of some ideal whole or system and any element not included within such a universal is, in relation to that universal, bare fact, and so relative chance. Chance, in other words, would not be actual chance if it were not also more. It is viewed in negative relation to some idea, but it could not exist in relation unless in itself it were ideal already. And with relative possibility, again, we find a counterpart implication. The possible itself would not be possible if it were not more, and if it were not partially real. There must be an actual basis in which a part of its conditions is realized, though, by and in the possible, this actual basis need not be expressed, but may be merely understood. And, since the conditions are manifold, and since the part which is taken as real is largely variable, possibility varies accordingly. Its way of completing itself, and in particular the actual basis which it implies, are both capable of diversity. Thus the possibility of an element is different, according as it is understood in these diverse relations. Possibility and chance, we may say, stand to one another thus. An actual fact more or less ignores the ideal complement which, within its own being, it involves. And hence, if you view it merely in relation to some system which falls outside itself, the actual fact is, so far, chance. The possible, on the other hand, explicitly isolates one part of the ideal complement, and, at the same time, implies, more or less vaguely, its real completion. It fluctuates, therefore, with the various conditions which are taken as necessary to complete it. But of these conditions part must have actual existence, or must, as such, be real. And this account still holds good when we pass to the lowest grade of possibility. I take an idea, which, in the first place, I cannot call unmeaning. And this idea, secondly, I do not see to contradict itself or the reality. I therefore assume that it has not this defect. And, merely on the strength of this, I go on to call such an idea possible. It might seem as if here we had passed from relative to unconditional possibility, but that view would be erroneous. The possible here is still a consequence from conditions, part of which is actual. For, 
though of its special conditions we know nothing, we are not quite ignorant. We have assumed in it more or less of the general character, material and formal, which is owned by reality. This character is its actual basis and real ground of possibility. And, without this, the idea would cease altogether to be possible. What are we to say then about the possibility, or about the chance, which is bare, and which is not relative, but absolute and unconditional? We must say of either that it presents one aspect of the same fundamental error. Each expresses in a different way the same main self-contradiction, and it may perhaps be worth while to exhibit this in detail. With mere possibility, the given one of all connection with the real is construed into a ground for positive predication. Bare chance, again, gives us as a fact, and gives us therefore in relation, an element which it still persists is unrelated. I will go on to explain this statement. I have an idea, and, because in my opinion I know nothing about it, I am to call it possible. Now, if the idea has a meaning, and is taken not to contradict itself, this, as we have seen, is, at once, a positive character in the idea. And this gives a known reason for, at once so far, regarding it as actual. And such a possibility, because in relation with an attribute of the real, we have seen, is still but a relative possibility. An absolute possibility we are supposed to be without this knowledge. There, merely because I do not find any relation between my idea and the reality, I am to assert, upon this, that my idea is compatible. And the assertion clearly is inconsistent. Compatible means that which in part is perceived to be true, it means that which internally is connected with the real. And this implies assimilation, and it involves penetration of the element by some quality or qualities of the real. If the element is compatible it will be preserved, though with a greater or less destruction of its particular character. But in bare possibility I have perverted the sense of compatible. Because I find absence of incompatibility, because, that is, I am without a certain perception, I am to call my idea compatible. On the ground of my sheer ignorance, in other words, I am to know that my idea is assimilated, and that, to a greater or less extent, it will survive in reality. But such a position is irrational. That which is unconditionally possible is viewed apart from, and is supposed to remain undetermined by, relation to the real. There are no seen relations, and therefore none, and therefore no alien relations which can penetrate and dissolve our supposed idea. And we hold to this, even when the idea is applied to the real. But a relation to the real implies essentially a relation to what the real possesses, and hence to have no relations of one's own means to have them all from the outside. Bare possibility is therefore, against its will, one extreme of relatedness. For it is conjoined de facto with the reality, as we have that in our minds, and, since the conjunction is external, the relatedness is given by outer necessity. But necessary relation of an element to that which is outside means, as we know, the disruption of this element internally. The merely possible, if it could exist, would be, therefore, for all we know, sheer error. For it would, so far as we know, be an idea, which, in no way and to no extent, is accepted by reality. But possibility, in this sense, has contradicted itself. Without an actual basis in, and without a positive connection with, reality, the possible is, in short, 
not possible at all. There is a like self-contradiction in absolute chance. The absolutely contingent would mean a fact which is given free from all internal connection with its context. It would have to stand without relation, or rather with all its relations outside. But, since a thing must be determined by the relations in which it stands, the absolutely contingent would thus be utterly determined from the outside. And so, by consequence, chance would involve complete internal dissipation. It would hence implicitly preclude the given existence which explicitly it postulates. Unless chance is more than mere chance, and thus consents to be relative, it fails to be itself. Relative chance implies inclusion within some ideal whole, and, on that basis, asserts an external relation to some other whole. But chance, made absolute, has to affirm a positive existence in relation, while insisting that all relations fall outside this existence. And such an idea contradicts itself. Or, again, we may bring out the same discrepancy thus. In the case of a given element, we fail to see its connection with some system. We do not perceive in its content the internal relations to what is beyond it, relations which, because they are ideal, are necessary and eternal. Then, upon the ground of this failure, we go on to a denial, and we insist that no such internal relations are present. But every relation, as we have learnt, essentially penetrates the being of its terms, and, in this sense, is intrinsical, or, in other words, every relation must be a relation of content. And hence the element, deprived by bare chance of all ideal relations, is unrelated altogether. But, if unrelated and undetermined, it is no longer any separate element at all. It cannot have the existence ascribed to it by absolute chance. Chance and possibility may be called two different aspects of one complex. Relative chance stands for something which is, but is, in part, not connected and understood. It is therefore that which exists, but, in part, only somehow. The relatively possible is, on the other hand, what is understood incompletely, and yet is taken, more or less only somehow, to be real. Each is thus an imperfect way of representing reality. Or we may, if we please, repeat the distinction in another form. In bare chance something is to be given, and therefore given in a connection of outer relations, and it yet is regarded as not intrinsically related. The abstractly possible, again, is the not related, but it is taken, at the same time, in relation with reality, and is, therefore, unawares given with external relations. Chance forgets, we may say, the essential connection, and possibility forgets its de facto relation to the real, that is, its given external conjunction with context. Chance belongs to the world of existence and possibility to thought, but each contains at bottom the same defect, and each, against its will, when taken bare, becomes external necessity. If the possible could be given, it would be indifferently chance or fate. If chance is thought of, it is at once but merely possible, for what is contingent has no complete connection with reality. With this I will pass from a subject, on which I have dwelt perhaps too long. There is no such thing as absolute chance, or as mere external necessity, or as unconditional possibility. The possible must, in part, be really, and that means internally necessary. And the same, again, is true of the contingent. 
Each idea is relative, and each lays stress on an opposite aspect of the same complex. And hence each, forced to a one-sided extreme, disappears altogether. We are led from this to ask whether there are degrees of possibility and contingency, and our answer to this question must be affirmative. To be more or less possible, and to be more or less true, and intrinsically necessary, and, from the other side, to be less or more contingent, are, in the end, all the same. And we may verify here, in passing, the twofold application of our standard. That which is more possible is either internally more harmonious and inclusive, it is, in other words, nearer to a complete totality of content, such as would involve passage into, and unity with, the real. Or the more possible is, on the other hand, partly realized in a larger number of ideal groups. Every contact, even with a point in the temporal series, means ideal connection with a concrete group of relations. Hence the more widely possible is that which finds a smaller amount of content lying wholly outside its own area. It is, in other words, the more individual, the truer, and more real. And, since it contains more connections, it has in itself more internal necessity. For a like reason, on the other side, Increase of contingency means growth in falseness. That which, so far as it exists, has more external necessity, more conjunction from the outside with intelligible systems, has, therefore, less connection with any. It is hence more empty, and, as we have seen, on that account less self-contained and harmonious. This brief account, however incorrect to the eye of common sense, may perhaps, as part of our main thesis, be found defensible. It will throw a light on that thesis if we end by briefly considering the ontological proof. N. Is a conclusion drawn from the presence of some thought to the reality of that which the thought contains. Now, of course, anyone at a glance can see how futile this might be. If you identify reality with spatial or even temporal existence, and understand by thought the idea of some distinct finite object, nothing seems more evident than that the idea may be merely in my head. When, however, we turn from this to consider the general nature of error, then what seemed so evident becomes obscure and presents us with a puzzle. For what is in my head must, after all, be surely somewhere in the universe. And when an idea qualifies the universe, how can it be excluded from reality? The attempt to answer such a question leads to a distinction between reality and finite existence. And, upon this, the ontological proof may perhaps seem better worth examining. Now a thought only in my head, or a bare idea separated from all relation to the real world, is a false abstraction. For we have seen that to hold the thought is, more or less vaguely, to refer it to reality. And hence an idea, wholly unreferred, would be a self-contradiction. This general result at once bears upon the ontological proof. Evidently, the proof must start with an idea referred to and qualifying reality, and with reality present also and determined by the content of the idea. And the principle of the argument is simply this, that, standing on one side of such a whole, you find yourself moved necessarily towards the other side. Mere thought, because incomplete, suggests logically the other element already implied in it, and that element is the reality which appears in existence. On precisely the same principle, but beginning from the other end, the cosmological proof may be said to argue to the character of the real. 
since reality is qualified by thought it therefore must possess whatever feature thought's essence involves and the principle underlying these arguments that given one side of a connected whole you can go from this to the other sides is surely irrefragable the real failure of the ontological proof lies elsewhere for that proof does not urge merely that its idea must certainly somehow be real it goes beyond this statement and qualifies it by real as such and here the argument seems likely to deviate into error for a general principle that every predicate as such is true of reality is evidently false we have learnt on the contrary that truth and reality are matter of degree a predicate we may say in no case is as such really true all will be subject to addition to qualification and rearrangement and its truth will be the degree up to which any predicate when made real preserves its own character in chapter fourteen when dealing with the idea of perfection we partly saw how the ontological argument breaks down and the general result of the present chapter should have cleared away difficulties any arrangement existing in my head must qualify the absolute reality but when the false abstraction of my private view is supplemented and made good that arrangement may as such have completely disappeared the ontological proof then should be merely another way of insisting on this doctrine not every idea will as such be real or as such have existence but the greater the perfection of a thought and the more its possibility and its internal necessity are increased so much more reality it possesses and so much the more necessarily must it show itself and appear somehow in existence but the ontological argument it will be rightly said makes no pretense of being applicable to every finite matter it is used of the absolute and if confined to that will be surely legitimate we are i think bound to admit this claim the idea of the absolute as an idea is inconsistent with itself and we find that to complete itself it is internally driven to take in existence but even here we are still compelled to keep up some protest against the addition of as such no idea in the end can strictly as such reach reality for as an idea it never includes the required totality of conditions reality is concrete while the truest truth must still be more or less abstract or we may put the same thing otherwise by objecting to the form of the argument the separation postulated in the premise is destroyed by the conclusion and hence the premise itself could not have been true this objection is valid and it is not less valid because it holds in the end of every possible argument but the objection disappears when we recognize the genuine character of the process this consists in the correction by the whole of an attempted isolation on the part of its members and whether you begin from the side of existence or of thought the process will remain essentially the same there is a subject and a predicate and there is the internal necessity on each side of identity with the other side but since in this consummation the division as such is transcended neither the predicate nor the subject is able to survive they are each preserved but transmuted there is another point on which in conclusion it is well to insist if by reality we mean existence as a presented event then to be real in this sense marks a low type of being it needs no great advance in the scale of reality and truth 
in order to make a thing too good for existence such as this. And I will illustrate my meaning by a kind of bastard use of the ontological proof. Every idea, it is certain, possesses a sensible side or aspect. Beside being a content, it, in other words, must be also an event. Now to describe the various existences of ideas as psychical events is for the most part a task falling outside metaphysics. But the question possesses a certain bearing here. The existence of an idea can be, to a greater or to a less degree, incongruous with its content, and to predicate the second of the first would involve various amounts of inconsistency. The thought of a past idea, for example, is a present state of mind, the idea of a virtue may be moral vice, and the horse, as judged to exist, cannot live in the same field with the actual horse image. On the other hand, at least in most cases, to think of anger is, to however slight an extent, to be angry, and, usually, ideas of pleasures and pains are, as events, themselves pleasures and pains in fact. Wherever the idea can be merely one aspect of a single presentation, there we can say that the ideal content exists and is an actual event. And it is possible, in such cases, to apply a semblance of the ontological proof. Because, that is, the existence of the fact is necessary, as a basis and as a condition, for the idea, we can go from the presence of the idea to the presence of the fact. The most striking instance would be supplied by the idea of this or mine. Immediate contact with reality can obviously, as a fact, never fail us, and so, when we use the idea of this contact, we take it always from the fact as, in some form, that appears. It is therefore impossible that, given the idea, its existence should be lacking. But, when we consider such a case more closely, its spuriousness is manifest. For, in the first place, the ideal content is not moved from within. It does not of itself seek completion through existence, and so imply that by internal necessity. There is no intrinsic connection, there is but a mere found conjunction between the two sides of idea and existence. And hence the argument, to be valid here, must be based on the mediation of a third element, an element coexisting with, but of itself extraneous to, both sides. But with this the essence of the ontological argument is wanting. And, in the second place, the case we are considering exhibits another gross defect. The idea, which it predicates of the real, possesses hardly any truth, and has not risen above the lowest level of worth and reality. I do not mean merely that the idea, as compared with its own existence, is abstract and so false. For that objection, although valid, is relatively slight I mean that, though the argument starting from the idea may exhibit existence, it is not able to show either truth or reality. It proves on the other hand, contrary to its wish, a vital failure in both. Neither the subject, nor again the predicate, possesses really the nature assigned to it. The subject is taken as being merely a sensible event, and the predicate is taken as one feature included in that fact. And in each of these assumptions the argument is grossly mistaken. For the genuine subject is reality, while the genuine predicate asserts of this every character contained in the ostensible predicate and subject. The idea, qualified as existing in a certain sensible event, is the predicate, in other words, which is affirmed of the absolute. And since such a predicate is a poor abstraction, and since its essence, therefore, 
is determined by what falls outside its own being, it is, hence, inconsistent with itself and contradicts its proper subject. We have in brief, by considering the spurious ontological proof, been led once more to the conclusion that existence is not reality. Existence is not reality, and reality must exist. Each of these truths is essential to an understanding of the whole, and each of them, necessarily in the end, is implied in the other. Existence is, in other words, a form of the appearance of the real. And we have seen that to appear, as such, in one or in many events, is to show therefore a limited and low type of development. But, on the other hand, not to appear at all in the series of time, not to exhibit one's nature in the field of existence, is to be false and unreal. And to be more true, and to be more real, is, in some way or other, to be more manifest outwardly. For the truer always is wider. There is a fair presumption that any truth, which cannot be exhibited at work, is for the most part untrue. And, with this understanding, we may take our leave of the ontological proof. Our inspection of it, perhaps, has served to confirm us in the general doctrine arrived at in our chapter. It is only a view which asserts degrees of reality and truth, and which has a rational meaning for words such as higher and lower, it is only such a view which can do justice alike to the sides of idea and existence. 